come up with creative ideas to do things that no one ever thought about before. So to do that, you got to get people out of their boxes and out of your box. As a manager, you become a lid on somebody's box. This is the cube they work in. They can't get out of this box because that's all they can work in. And so you got to figure out ways to, to spread creativity out without messing up the um, the safety or the quality or the other things that happen. You got to figure out ways for people to be successful to make your company successful. Does that make sense? And as a manager, that's the hardest thing to do because it takes risk. If somebody makes a mistake, it makes them more um, important to your company because they've seen mistakes. Remember that situational leadership? What's the difference between this, this, let's see, this point and this point? Experience. What's the difference between this point and this point? Experience. At this point, if you, if you close them down at this point, they're never going to take another risk. They don't know how much they know at this point, and they're insecure at this point. So getting them out of this box and into this box, which is infinite, <laughs> is, is Seven a problem. Helpful charts. Right. When I look at these charts, I see something very simple and something very overly simple in some cases. Uh, I like them a lot. They're very important. But you got to think about who Deming was talking to. He was talking to the management and how to bring the people into the decision-making process. And these charts help you make that decision-making process. But he's talking about uneducated people, right? Usually uh, at that time, sixth grade education maybe, or high school education. Very few of them had college educations on the working line within manufacturing companies. So if you can use these same techniques and explode them to all the other tools that are out there, there are a thousand tools out there. Some of them are really good and, and pick and choose, not just these tools. Those tools are great for that audience, but you have other tools too, right? But flow charts, I'm going to use this as an example. Uh, Deming had, your book talks about flow charts and talks about a way to use flow charts. I'm going to change that to a great degree. I'm going to say flow charts are very important. Why would you use a flow chart? What's in your head, your mental model is different than what's in your mental model. And that's different what's in your mental model, different what's your mental model. And we all have the same job title, right? So we can all have the same job title and do 16 different things, and there's only, you know, 12 of us. <laughs> so, so first thing you do is you put it down on paper what's in your mind. And you look at everybody, and you say, this may be what I think's going on. This is what you think is going on. This is what you think is going on. Let's make one process out of it that takes the best of everything we do and put it in one place. Does that make sense? All right, so now... What I did was I took some techniques that are, that are um, the first time I ever saw this, we actually did it. I mean, we didn't even know anybody else was doing it. So I'm not sure it existed. Um, it was about 86 when we first started doing this. And I'm not sure the swimming lanes existed back then. I'm not sure the numbering system existed back then. It was very simple flow charts. If you look at this group here, some, if you look at uh, flow charts now, they call those swimming lanes. There's different groups of people swimming their own lane. That's what it means. Uh, but, for example, the customer swims in this lane. A uh, client organization swims in that lane. The, this is actually an example of training at NASA. Okay? So the... Uh, Let's see, Employee Organizational Development Department swims in this lane. They're the trainers and all the HR people. Uh, the vendors swim in swim this lane, and the purchasing swims in that lane. So get, get the gist of it. Now, so the swimming lanes. Why is it important for, to have that? Because it adds a little information. It makes it a little easier to see, well, who does this work? And, and it helps you to see how you fit together. And if you're missing somebody, you can add them to the list. And, and so that's one thing. Another thing you might notice is this: all, everything I'm going to show you fits on one page. So it's not spread across the room. It's all designed to fit on one page at a time. Because if you print it out, you're going to print out you know, one page at a time of, of a notebook sheet of paper and put it in a notebook and all kinds of things. So we try to, try to fit everything on one page. Different tasks have different WBS-type numbering system. 
WBS work breakdown structure talks about deliverables. We're talking about tasks, so it's kind of a work breakdown structure type situation. But what we're doing is we're looking at this numbering system. Now, why do you need a unique identifier for each task? Right, a relational database. In a relational database, you have a whole bunch of files that have some kind of relational field, and, and that relational field will connect to all those files, and that's how you bring them all together. So if, if it's about you, it might be your social security number. If the phone company's using it, it might be a phone number with addresses and other things and location and problems they're having. But they use the same number to say, oh, here's, it connects to all this information floating around out there. That's a relational database. If you're going to do a flow chart, can you put all the information you need in one box? You just put a title in one box, maybe editing. If this is the first edit, second edit, third edit, fourth edit, it may still be titled editing. Okay? So editing with different numbers mean at different places in the process of creating your documents. So, so that's the numbering system. Now look at this number, 3005.1. What does the 3 represent? There's a 5, there's a 2. What does the, what does the first number represent? Exactly. So just by the number, I can tell you who's responsible. Does that make sense? The last number is the same for all of these, and it just happens to be phase 1. What does last number mean? What phase? Yeah, it makes sense. But but the whole point is, just by the numbering system, I'll tell you what phase it's in. Right? This phase happens to be analyzed needs. Now, this number is 5, 10, 20, 30, 50, there's a 40. So what does that number mean? Just a counter, right? And so over here, there's a 10, and over here's a 10, but the number's different because it has the first number different, right? So I don't want to just number to millions. I want to number them all differently. And I can tell about where in the chart it all fits. If you give me a, a 50, I know it comes after a 10. So there's some kind of logic to it, right? So the numbering system is very important. And if I write a letter and I say we're having a problem, we need to replace this um, uh, supply assessment tool. And the number is 2.010.2. One, and it's in the letter. I know by going back to my different documents what it is that we're trying to replace, right? So it's, it's, there's some kind of records management there. Okay, if you look at the next page, there's actually a different color for the page. You don't have to use color, but you, you have color available, so use it. Um, so a different color for the page. Different phases and different pages use different colors on each page. So I know that if, for example, this page is different from this page color and it's different from this page color, you can't really tell, but that's kind of a, a brownish white, and this is a white, and this is a greenish color over here. So I'm looking for that color page, which is different from that color page, and I know that this box with that number feeds into this box and it goes to another page with that number on it. So it kind of gives me an idea so I can look at it and see what comes after that, what comes before this. And this is the second phase, which is training program selection process. First we analyze needs, now we have the training program selection. Now who's the vendor who's going to do the training? Okay, on this page is different color again, right? Here's something else to think of. Time goes that way. So now I can put a time scale on it if I wanted to. Say this is this all happens within week. This is the next week, and that's the next week, and so on and so on. Okay, or I can put a date on it if it's cyclical. Uh, okay, another page. Uh, notice different colors for the different groupings. Don't have to do it, but it, these all are related to uh, records meeting dates and schedules and all kinds of things. So that's all related to records management. And this one's related to vendors, vendors, and this one's related to registration. But it gives us some ideas, right? Okay, and then the last page. Um, but the thing about that, that whole thing was not a special software you used, it was PowerPoint. I could have clicked on any of those boxes, moved them anywhere, and just it's all done in PowerPoint. You don't need it. You don't need to be an expert in Visio, you just need to know how to draw pictures.